Hi everybody, I'm Jim Skelly and this is The Global Conversation. Um, we're just approaching the midterm in the fall semester and I wanted to bring a couple of things to your attention. One of the most important of them is that we are forming the learning circles, the study circles that you will all be participating in for the next month and a half or so. And I wanted to urge you to take a look at the guidelines. You'll find them on the left-hand side of the uh, web page, the homepage for the course. Um, and I'd like you to take a look and see exactly what learning circle you'd like to be in and to send Ray Haggerty or Sadie Ludmere um, a note about which circles you prefer. Now there are going to be five of them this semester and each of them will have between six and eight students and one or two teaching assistants in each circle. And the teaching assistants will help, of course, uh, push the project along, but all of you should be engaging in it as, as fully as possible. Um, what we want to do is to see if you can create across national and other sorts of boundaries if you can create a common project which speaks to some of the challenges and problems that uh, that we face uh, in the environmental realm. Now, let me tell you what the five circle areas are. Um, one is international food production. Uh, that's a very interesting topic and it's uh, one of the, the teaching assistants are Ali Kaya from Turkey and Jenna Goodhand from Canada. Jenna has long been very, very concerned with uh, food issues, and I think you might find working with her and Ali uh, quite stimulating. Um, another is uh, consumerism and globalization. Uh, consumerism always gets a great deal of attention because we all know that deep down many of us are consumers. So don't hesitate. That one is quite fun. Um, um, human population is a third one. Uh, alternative energy systems uh, is also very interesting. Uh, here at Juniata College, we'll be making a um, site visit to um, a little field trip, actually, to a, to a farm that's um, a recycling animal waste uh, for use to, uh, to develop methane gas that is then used to heat and uh, a greenhouse where vegetables and other things are grown. Um, the final one is global climate change, which of course should be on everybody's agenda. So let me uh, tell you how the process works. What you should do, and, and send these to either Ray or Jenna, uh, or if you want to me, um, choose your, make your first choice, and then tell us what your second or third choice is as well. Uh, we can't necessarily guarantee that we'll give you your first chance, so, uh, your first choice, although um, we try to do that. Um, what we would like to do is make sure we have enough diversity in each circle so that people from different parts of the world, etc., participate in a common project. It's, you know, to, to, to essentially live out our metaphor of uh, a global conversation. So send us your three top choices. Uh, the study circle guidelines, as I said, are on the um, left-hand side of the uh, course homepage. Uh, if you have any trouble finding that, send uh, Ray, Sadie, or me uh, uh, an email, or if there's any confusion about it, please do let us know. The other thing is that Ray Haggerty will be shortly sending you a, um, an email uh, with uh, a little exercise in which you measure your ecological footprint. One of the things that we know is that many, many people live as though um, they have five planets to live on. It's, it's true that most Americans, if everyone lived the way most Americans do, you would need between four and five planets to take care of the Earth's population. So some people live very poorly and some do not. And what's useful is in assessing your ecological footprint, you come to realize the way in which 
you engage in excessive behavior and you can begin to think about some both personal solutions but also how we might organize uh, more broadly for solutions that would cut down on um, energy use or carbon footprint uh, and uh, other activities which are deleterious for the environment. The final thing I wanted to talk to you about today is the midterm essay. Now some students, for example those at the Institute for Social and European Studies in Hungary are not required at this point because they're just getting started um, to do the midterm essay. I'll be in touch with them separately about uh, their academic requirements for the course and I'll hope to see them the next month in person in November when I visit. Um, however, um, for the others, let me just say a couple of things about it. And this is useful for anybody uh, in thinking about the overall course. The essay, which you'll find at the top of the course homepage, um, essentially says that you should um, uh, take a contextual approach and a contextual or a structural approach. I'm a sociologist. I always think, is this something that's related to a person's individual behavior or is there a structural issue at play? Um, now, uh, the first thing we ask you to do, and you'll go, if you go back to the early part of the course, you'll find a very short excerpt from um, the sociologist C. Wright Mills um, it's from his book called The Sociological Imagination. Um, what you'll find is a four-page excerpt uh, about the distinction between private troubles and public issues. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. One, given the ideology that tends to be dominant in many countries, people see difficulties that people face through the lens of the private or privatized. So, um, as I was explaining to students in class today, uh, Mills makes the distinction, uh, for example, that if one person is unemployed out of, uh, so let's say, 500 people, you might look to the person's character. However, if it's 50% of the employable population, you need to look instead to the way in which the economic structures are organized. Uh, this means that you have to look at the broader context. You know, we keep talking in this course about connecting the dots, right? So we want you to think about the way in which the structure is organized such that many of the issues we're dealing with have to be dealt with in a public manner. In other words, politically, we have to change how the structure is currently organized. Uh, so make sure you get that distinction correctly. Uh, one of the examples I gave in class today was about the concept of stress. Now you can say uh, to somebody, oh, you know, you need uh, to be careful because you're obviously too stressed out by working. And let's take the case of, of a, a hospital ward where let's say there are 30, a uh, large hospital ward where there are 30 nurses employed. Management decides to cut the uh, amount of nurses by one half, and therefore you only have 15 nurses. And the next thing that people experience is what's called stress, but which is really tied to overwork. They're doing the work of two people, each person is doing the work of two people, and this is what is characterized as stressful. But if you use that concept, you are saying essentially that the problem exists in the person, not the structure. So you want to take a look at any situation and say, well, wait a second, this is a structural problem. We need more people working in the hospital ward. What happens when you cut employment in that situation is that you have people saying, well, um, you're suffering stress, right? So it's a private trouble. That's an ideological move, right? You want to say, is it really a private trouble or is it the way the authorities, shall we say, have organized 
the particular institutional structure. So consider that when you're considering various problems that we, challenge, uh, we face and think about whether they are in fact troubles or public issues, okay? In the case of the nurses, what's happened is parallel to what Annie Leonard talks about in the story of stuff. And as I said to students today, I'd like to hear people in their essays talk about the externalization of costs. Because what happens is when you you know, suffer from stress, you're essentially suffering from the fact that the institutional structure has externalized the costs of whatever the activity is, whatever the work is, to your body and mental well-being, okay? Uh, we've seen this in many other areas. So start to think in that way, and then this essay will be much easier to address, okay? Um, and I then go into to suggesting to you that you uh, pay a special attention to the article by Amitai Etzioni, uh, America Spent in the Aftermath of Consumerism, and uh, Jared Diamond's analysis with regard to uh, other societies which have exceeded their environmental limits. Um, and part of what I'm trying to get you to do in this second part of the essay is to consider the way in which uh, many of the public issues that we face are dealt with in a decontextualized fashion. So if, for example, you uh, think it's a good idea to create biofuels, you need to think about may, perhaps it would be better to change the transportation structure, get away from individualized modes of transportation, and in fact, think about what happens when you use, let's say, corn for ethanol. If you take a contextualized approach, you'll recognize that food prices, or the price of corn, in places where corn is a staple part of the diet, are going to go up, right? Just so you can have fuel for your individualized modes of transportation. That's and so to think that biofuel is just great is to see it from a decontextualized perspective. Keep that in mind as you're addressing various issues, and I'm sure you'll write a very, very fine essay. And let me say, too, that in no way am I interested in um, simply grading essays. I will say it again and again that the reason I have structured the essay in the way that I have is so that you can take cognitive control of the material that we've been dealing with in the first part of the course. Uh, all the best to you, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or Sadie or Ray, okay, and I'll talk to you again soon in the second half of the semester. All the best.